a little bit of using a little bit of using zoom in case you are new to that or forgotten how to or just would like a little refresher so if you saw the video the slides playing before you can kind of get a hint to how we're doing zoom but you have the controls on the bottom so if you would go to the left hand side of your screen you can hover over the bottom and a toolbar should pop up all the way on the left side is a little microphone icon and if you click on that you can mute or unmute yourself and we're asking that everybody remain muted tonight until maybe the end while we have some questions but that will just help with some of the background noise to the right of that is a little video icon and if you click on that you can shut your computer your view off so that um maybe that will help with the bandwidth so Go ahead and if you're comfortable, you can shut your videos off tonight um, and that will help with everybody's um, streaming of the video tonight. The next thing I'd like to talk about to the right of the video icon is the chat box. We're going to be using that quite a bit tonight. So if you'd like to communicate with us, you can just go ahead and um, put in a quick chat, a question, a comment, but make sure you select everyone so that everybody sees the um, question or comment so that we all can all know what's going on and um, we can learn through that way as well. Um, let's see, I think we're ready to switch to our feature presentation tonight. So if you just give me a second and I will switch to that. All right, so this evening um, we'll be presenting the Lambing Basics skills for you tonight. And I'm Carolyn Eady, the Extension Ag Educator for Crackford and Richland Counties. Thanks for joining us. And behind the scenes tonight is Gene Schrieffer from Iowa County. He'll be fielding some of those questions if you're putting those in the chat box. And he's also helping us with some technology. So thanks, Gene, on that. We're going to do a quick poll before we get started just to know who's in sorry know who's in the room and let know a little bit about you so i'm going to ahead and put that first poll up and go ahead and answer the questions and then we will come back and chat and see who's all in the room Are you all able to see that? Okay, very good. All right, you guys are doing good. We're up to about 71% of you um, answering the poll. So we'll just wait um, a few more seconds so the rest of you can try to get in. All right, we are at 83%. So I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and we'll take a look. Um, so this is who is who is with us tonight. A lot of you guys have some meat sheep out there. Um, a lot of you guys, oh, sorry, my cursor is a little crazy today. Um, livestock for showing. Um, on, 
Some of you have um, one to 15 animals, but we see some somebody has up to 90, so that's great. Thanks for joining us tonight. We have several new producers and um, some of you that have a lot of experience. So thanks um, for joining us tonight. So tonight um, we're going to provide you with some information um, that's relevant and timely. I think a lot of us may be going into the lambing season. I know that I've got some of my own ewes um, pinned up right now and I'm anxiously awaiting their babies. So we'll share, provide the information, share, share, share some ideas, um, demonstrate lamb care techniques and answer questions. And then we're hoping to do this so that you are more prepared, confident and successful in this year's lamb crop. Tonight's presentator, pres, is gonna, presentation is going to be done by um, Todd Taylor. He is the University of Wisconsin Sheep Research Manager at Arlington. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Can you hear me? Yes, we testing, can, Todd. Testing. Okay, so, so I'm trying something a little different so I can kind of follow along on the PowerPoint. I've got my laptop set up through the Wi-Fi. And I've got my phone on as well, and I'm talking through my phone. So we'll see how this works. If I have to, I can shut my laptop down and just go strictly to the phone. So I uh, appreciate everybody coming on from the poll. It looks like we've got a, a whole lot of people that are uh, uh, new to um, uh, to sheep production or just, just uh, uh, short term. Um, you know, so it's nice to see the, the new interest, but we also have some veterans on here. So as we go along here, feel free to chat or to, to chat with Jean and Carolyn. Uh, I probably won't be able to see the chat as we get further along into it. And, and uh, uh, so hopefully one of them can interrupt me if there's questions that they feel like need to be answered by me. Uh, Jean does a, a really good job of, of answering questions. I saw uh, Bernie O'Rourke is also on here, and, and Bernie can, can jump in and maybe answer some questions as well. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through. Uh, Carolyn put together this, this PowerPoint presentation, and, and Jean and I put in our two cents worth on it, but she did an excellent job of putting it together. What we're going to do is quick run through it first, just kind of pull together some points with, with slides and pictures and information. And then I'm hoping that my phone works and my wife is here with me tonight and she's going to run the phone and be my camera operator and, and try to take some video and, and show you what's going on here in the Lamb and Barn. Uh, for those of you uh, from afar that don't necessarily know who I am, my name is Todd Taylor. I've been the shepherd here at University of Wisconsin since 2001. Uh, I came here after I finished my master's in, in animal science at Texas A&M, spent seven years in College Station managing their sheep program but I grew up at the University of Wyoming lambing facilities. My dad was a herdsman there for 27 years. So uh, 29 years, excuse me. Um, so I've, I've been essentially uh, raised in a, in a university sheep barn my, my whole life. Uh, we've raised four kids here at the, at the Arlington Research Station. Our, our last one is actually uh, finished with high school now and will be working essentially full-time this last semester of his high school career. But uh, uh, all four of them have been through the sheep program. program. Um, three of them are out in college and on their own now or, or on their own now. And, and so it's an industry that is near and dear to our hearts and something that, like I said, has been able to, to help us raise uh, four independent, hardworking uh, young individuals that, that we're, we're pretty pleased with, with the direction that they're, they're going in life right now. So with that, Carolyn, we can roll through these, these PowerPoint slides quick and, and then get to what everybody wants to see. And hopefully that's some, some young little lambs running around and bouncing and playing. I don't think I have anything lambing tonight. I was hoping that I would have, but uh, things have been a little bit slow this week. <clears throat> so this first slide is, is just kind of one that we stuck in. Uh, for those of you that are new and even those that are veterans, one place to go to get an awful lot of good sheep, very, very good uh, uh, handy sheep information is is uh, sheep 101, and I think they actually have a sheep, and actually this is from 201. Um, the, this is a program that University of Maryland put together. Uh, the Maryland F Small Ruminant webpage uh, uh, is, is a very good place on the internet to go for sheep information, and, and they have some very good listings of just basic supplies that going into a lambing season you should have uh, or could have or need to at least think about where you can find uh, some of these things. So, you know, 
things that we routinely keep close by both here at the farm and where we keep our sheep for our personal flock that we lamb off the station. Uh, of course, we always have plenty of halters around because invariably you're going to have to catch a ewe and restrain her somehow when you're by yourself. Uh, a halter is a great way to do that, to, to check, uh, check udder quality, check milk quality, check what's going on there. Uh, of course, during lambing season, if you're going to assist in birthing lambs, you need to have some latex gloves or some protective sleeves. We have plenty of those around. Uh, we like to keep some OB lubrication around just to, to, to help if you have a, a, a sticky birth. Uh, no, no uh, excuse the pun there, but occasionally you have one that gets a little bit challenging and it's nice to have a, uh, uh, some lubrication around to, to help and assist in those. Uh, nylon rope or, or snare or leg pullers. I don't very often use these, but it, they are sometimes come in handy. Uh, we do have a lamb puller uh, hanging up here and I will get that out and show that as we go through. Uh, it's more for ca catching the, the head and helping assist in one that's got a head back or something like that. Disinfectants are nice to have. Uh, we always utilize disinfectants when we're pulling lambs. We try to scrub around the, the vulva a little bit, especially if it's a tricky birth that we've got to go in a little deeper. We want to keep that thing clean so that we don't uh, uh, tend to uh, you know, push anything into the uterus and create uterine infections. And of course, supplements. you know. Uh, milk replaced or frozen colostrum, or anything like that, because as we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, these first few hours of these lambs' birth is probably the most critical time to get them off and going, and that colostrum is extremely important. Lamb bottles and lamb nipples, ear tags for, for identification, uh, iodine for those, those uh, uh, disinfecting those navels, uh, of course, needles and syringes. You need, uh, you need devices and equipment for docking tails, castrating lambs. We'll talk a little bit about, about more about that. Uh, of course, your vaccinations or antibiotics that you might need will be handy to have around. Um, you know, records, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, lamb tubing apparatus, uh, uh, you might have a lamb that you have to tube once in a while. Uh, so you'll want an esophageal feeding tube and, and, you know, learn how to use those. They, they can be lifesavers, literally. Uh, of course, the thermometer is always handy. handy. We have scales around. All these things and then some I'm going to show you as we move along and do a tour of the lambing facility here on the farm. Go ahead, Carolyn. So the first thing to think about, and, and before you're ready to start a sheep operation, you need to think about these things pretty crit critically. Number one, what is your ultimate goal? What time of year do you want to lamb? Do you want to lamb in the, in the, on pasture? Do you have the facilities to deal with winter lambing? Um, so housing needs are extremely important. Uh, we'll show you what we do here. Uh, we lamb several times a year here at the farm and my kids do as well. We lamb in the fall and then we have uh, essentially an extended spring lambing season that runs from the 1st of January through the 1st of April. Uh, but we have facilities that can, that can deal with pretty harsh and inclement weather. Uh, if you don't have facilities where you can offer these sheep from some, some protection from bitter cold and, and heavy snow and high moisture. Uh, you probably don't want to be lambing in January, February, and even maybe into March. You maybe want to wait and lamb in the spring. Uh, sheep can withstand some pretty, and lambs can withstand some pretty harsh temperatures and harsh climates, but in the northern areas where we're at, uh, with the amount of snowfall and the bitter cold that we get, if you don't have some protection, especially from the wind and the moisture, uh, and, and a lot of times three-sided open barns aren't even enough in this country. So some way of being able to seal those ewes up at night is, is, is extremely handy and can be very critical. Um, if you don't have those facilities, you know, it's fine to still raise sheep and you can raise them in a three-sided barn, uh, but I wouldn't suggest lambing in the dead of winter if you've got that kind of situation. So think about that. Think about uh, uh, where you're located, what your, your end market is, um, and, and, you know, plan your breeding and, and lambing accordingly. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with lambing in the summer or the fall or early summer. Uh, it's a little harder maybe sometimes to get to use bread. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, honestly, my favorite time to lamb is in the fall. I really like to lamb in September and October. Uh, we have excellent luck here with lamb in those time of years, cause, that time of year, because you seem to not have to deal with the, the bitter cold, bitter, bitter wet rain. Uh, the flies are usually gone by then. You don't have to deal with that. Uh, and then the markets when those lambs are ready is usually when it's the highest. So if you can figure out how to do some fall lambing, I would strongly recommend it. But there are some challenges of fall lambing in terms of uh, finding breeds that will readily do it. Sheep are seasonal breeders. Uh, 
typically lay, they like to lamb from the winter and, and most generally the spring and early summer months. So fall lambing can be a little bit challenging. Um, but uh, uh, but I, like I said, if I could get 90% or at least 50% of my use to lamb in the fall, I would be extremely, extremely happy. But it's, sometimes it's pretty challenging to do. So, um, you know, make sure your building is big enough. Make sure you have plenty of dry bedding. Keep that on hand. Uh, and of course, access to, to clean water and plenty of bunk space for those used to get feed is also very critical. And we'll talk about that when we do the tour. I think the next couple of slides are just of our facilities. Um, this is our drop pen and we'll talk a little bit more about it here in a little bit when we go out and tour. Uh, this barn is, is the barn that I'm in right now. Uh, this barn is not heated, but it is closed on all three sides. Uh, we keep it bedded with a lot of straw. Um, it is dirt floor, earthen base. We actually clean it once or twice a year, depending on our needs. And then a lot of times we'll, we'll re, uh, uh, re lay down some, some limestone screenings and pack those down first before we start bedding over the top. And then we don't clean it during the lemon season. We just continually add straw over the top just to keep building it up and keeping it dry and keeping it as clean as we can. Uh, but then we clean it in the spring after we're done with all the, or completely done with lambing. So, uh, if it was a concrete floor, I would much rather clean it on occasion and let it dry out if we can and continue to just build up on top. So you can use old dairy barns, uh, but you do have to be very cognizant of the ammonia buildup in there and make sure you keep it dry and clean. Otherwise, you wind up with lung issues in lamb. So those concrete floors are fine. These old dairy barns, you know, re that's what we've done with our personal flock is we revamped an old dairy barn and it works. We just have to be very very careful of the ventilation in there and make sure we get plenty of fresh air movement. Otherwise we wind up with ammonia and lung issues. So, um, so, you know, I like a dirt, dirt floor. Uh, like I said, this barn is not heated. It's not even insulated, but it does an awfully good job of um, warming. You know, we put 200 U's in there in the winter time and it'll raise the temperature in that barn about 15 to 20 degrees from what it is outside. So it works very well to have it set up like this. <laughs> Go ahead. So the next thing you need to do, and we'll talk a little bit more about these as well, is uh, you, you do want some lambing jugs. And one thing I failed to mention on that last slide, and we'll talk about it as we, as we go through the tour, we do lamb outside in our drop pens. We do not move the lambs or the used in and let them lamb in these pens. So these are our lambing jugs that we have here at the Arlington Research Station. Uh, these are six by six jugs, which are plenty big. In fact, I would I would uh, someday wish I could afford to trade these in and buy, buy smaller ones and put a few more jugs in this room. Uh, this is a, a heated room. Uh, we keep the temperature about 55 to 60 degrees in this room, just enough to give the lambs a chance to warm up. Uh, give them a couple of days in here uh, with their moms. Uh, the jug, jugs are critical for a couple of reasons. The first one in our situation where we're shed lambing, uh, there is a very good potential and a, and a pretty high opportunity for cross fostering or mismothering. So in other words, we've got 30, 40 ewes shot in the pen outside out there and we have two of them lambing at once or one that's lambing and one that's getting close. A lot of times they will mix each other's lambs up. Um, I, I shouldn't say a lot of time, but it can happen on a, on a uh, surprisingly, over, uh, surprisingly often, often basis. You have to be really, really careful in shed lambing situations like this, if they're, if they're shut in and, and don't have room to spread out and, and isolate themselves. And it happens once in a while. So uh, like I said, we let the used lamb out in the drop pins and then move them into these jugs shortly after they give birth. Uh, when, we're, when we're monitoring lambing during the uh, drop period, we do have to keep an eye on those ewes once the ewe starts lambing. You know, we try to watch it. If there's two of them lambing at once, we may get a little bit more critical about getting those ewes moved into the jugs quicker. And the reason, the biggest reason for these jugs is to, uh, to help uh, encourage that bonding situation. Uh, you know, we want those ewes to, to learn who their lambs are and the lambs to learn who their mothers are and, and give them some time to, to make those uh, connections. And the jugs serve, serve extremely well for that. Uh, like I said, the size isn't real critical. It depends on the size of your ewe and the number of lambs that you have. Um, you know, we have a tremendous amount of triplets in our flock in the polyphase, especially. Uh, so, you know, the six by six jugs are good for triplet lambs, but we could get by with even, uh, you know, four by six or four by five or something like that. Uh, you know, and, and I think uh, our personal flock, our jugs are four by five or five by five. I don't remember which, but they're plenty big for the size of our ewes. Uh, some of the bigger purebred breeds, the Columbia's, the Suffolk's, they might require a little bit larger, larger jug. 
Um, <coughs> but for the most part, you know, what we have here works very, very well. Um, one contrast that I would say in our personal jug is they're more solid than these panels are. Uh, our barn is not near as warm as this. We don't have supplemental heat. So our jug panels are, are solid about uh, 26 to 28 inches high, I believe, um, so that it blocks the, the draft off of the lambs and keeps those lambs a little bit uh, freer from, from those drafts for the first 24 hours or so till they get up and get going well. Um, so, so again, you know, there's different styles of jugs, there's different layouts, there's different things that can be done. Uh, the other purpose of these is to monitor, make sure that the used udders are good. As we bring them in, we want to check those and make sure everything's good and the lambs are getting getting going well. So we'll we'll continue on and we'll come back and come back to these here in a little bit. I think we're gonna well, we can talk about this one a little bit. Uh, as you can see, this is an old dairy barn, or it was actually an old hog barn uh, before the university took it over. So it is a concrete floor. Um, again, like I said, concrete can be a a good place for, for uh, uh, sheep situations, but at the same time, you have to deal with the lack of area for uh, moisture to go. Uh, there's no place to absorb the moisture. So we clean these jugs between every U. We don't add more bedding on top. We actually strip them down to the floor, clean them out, try to give them 24 to 30, 36 hours to dry out as much as possible. And then we spread a pretty uh, liberal amount of barn lime down, just go to to the, the farm store and buy bags of barn lime. Um, we, we spread a pretty good bit down. Um, we used to, and I know some people that will use shavings in their jugs that are a little bit maybe more absorbent. Uh, we used to use shavings and actually put a little bit of straw over the top of it. We've gone away from the shavings mostly just because of cost. Uh, the straw is more, more uh, uh, inexpensive for us here and uh, seems to do just a, as good a job as, as the combination did. Plus, when we really get rolling and going, the ewes don't stay in our jugs for very long, so they don't get a lot of, uh, you know, they don't get too terribly dirty and nasty. So, so the ewes will stay in the jugs for us. Uh, as I said, they're put in the jugs after the lambs are born, after the ewes get a chance to lick on them for a few minutes. Um, if the weather's super cold, we'll get them in a little quicker. Otherwise, they come into the jugs, um, you know, right shortly after birth, and they go out of the jugs. A single might go out in 24 hours. A set of twins might get 36 to 48. Uh, we only have 13 permanent jugs, and we're, we're laminating 80 ewes in two weeks. Uh, they don't. We don't have time to leave them in the jugs for very long. So, uh, so our ewes learn to stay stay in the jugs a minimum amount of time. I know people that have that have situations where they might leave them in the jugs up to a week. Uh, we don't find that necessary, and we don't. Uh, we just can't. From a from a, a standpoint of design, we can't do it that way. So, uh, so ours, if they stay in the jugs more than uh, 48 hours, there's probably a problem that needs to be worked with. Otherwise, you know, they're in and out pretty quickly, and we move them into our mixing pens. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about mixing pens, but this is the next slide. I think this is one of Carolyn's mixing pens. You know, these lambs. You know, we have uh, seven mixing pens here in this facility that are big enough to hold from five to seven to eight use per pen and we'll show you those here in a little bit um you know they uh uh they're just a place for us to start mixing use and commingling use and lambs together in smaller groups before we move them out into group housing which is on the other side of the road we have group housing that uh allows us to uh uh mix upwards of 20 to 25 use and their lambs in a group together they're a little bit bigger so uh just gives us that transition period uh, they probably don't go into those bigger group pens until they're about 10 to uh, 7 to 10 to 12 days old. Again, your growing and housing areas, those pens, it's nice to be able to have them. Uh, again, have them at least three sided where they've got some protection from the elements. Um, ours is actually four sided except for a 10 foot hole where they can go outside when the, when the sun's out and it's nice. They'll actually go lay outside on the outside of the windbreak in the in the snow even and, and absorb the sun a little bit on that side of the road. So that's where they stay from the time they are about 10 days old to the time we wean them at 60 days. Again, we bed that pretty regularly. We have plenty of feeder space for the use to get their, their forage and grain needs. And we have a spot in the corner of those pens to put up a creep area for the lambs to get in and eat some supplemental creep feed for it with us. We have any questions that I need to deal with, guys? I see some quite a bit of chat going on. So, 
Looks like Gene's taking pretty good care of them. One thing to keep in mind, and, and there's a couple of things to realize here, um, you know, nutrient requirements for sheep. And I think this, I believe Carolyn pulled this from a publication from the Ohio State University. Uh, this just shows the increase in demand or the increase in, in need for supplemental energy or energy intake and protein intake as those ewes get into that third trimester and close to parturition. And you can definitely see in these slides here how quickly that need for energy and protein goes up in those last 30 to 45 days of gestation right up to lambing. So you really wanna keep that in mind. Um, you know, we always tell people that the first trimester or even into the second trimester, you know, sheep don't need a lot of other than just good um, quality forage, you know, and, and maybe a little grain supplement if they're in poorer body condition. If they're in good body condition, some average quality hay will be fine for them. But then as you move into that last uh, 45 days before lambing, you need to add some act extra energy in the form of whole shell corn. And you may need that or some sort of energy. Well, that's what we use is whole shell corn. And then we also offer a higher quality, higher protein hay. Or if you don't have that, maybe offer a use supplement, a protein pellet of some sort. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind as well is in Wisconsin in the north, you know, it's, it's common practice to shear sheep before, uh, before lambing or before they come into the, to the drop pins like we do. Um, but that also increases your energy and uh, requirements even more because it takes more to keep those ewes warm if you take the wool off of them. So if you don't have the facilities to offer them that supplemental protection, um, you know, you might not want to necessarily shear them tight. You may just want to do a technique that we call crutching where we shear the bellies and around the, the, the udder and the vulva on these ewes and leave that wool on them. Uh, again, that can offer some dangers in, in ewes that lay on lambs or ewes that bring an awful lot of snow and moisture into your facility. So again, you, you wanna think about those things and, and design your lambing program accordingly. You may wanna think about, again, if you don't have the facilities to be able to shear in, in the wintertime, you may not be necessarily wanting to lamb in the wintertime uh, because there are some challenges both ways. So uh, we can talk more about that as we move on. So this is where I was hoping that we'd have a U in labor and I could talk a little bit more about this, but uh, uh, signs of impending parturition or, or U that's getting close to lambing. Um, you know, Good we Lord. use a camera system in our barn. Um, we use a camera system in our barn so I can monitor them from the house or on my cell phone, wherever I'm at. And honestly, the first thing that I, I wait for, the first thing that I notice is typically a vocalization of the U. Uh, the ewes will get settled down and get calm and quiet after we feed them and shut the doors on them. And typically this happens at night or, or in the morning after morning feeding. Uh, we'll have a ewe start to get nervous and you can hear her vocalize. And then if you pull the camera up or you walk out to the barn or if you come into the barn and you hear one vocalizing, you can walk in and you'll see her. Usually she's isolating herself. She's pawing around the corner of the barn. She's digging a hole, uh, trying to do some nesting. Um, and then, and you know, she might, as, as Carolyn has on this side, she might urinate a little bit more frequently squat. Uh, of course, the lip, lip curling and head going straight up in the air as she starts to, to, to see, see uh, or to start to develop contractions. Um, usually it's if you feed at night and there's one that's in labor, she'll be the first one to walk away from the feed bunk or she won't even come to the feed bunk. Uh, you know, they're just, they just get nervous. And, and as you're, as you, you know, what I always encourage people to do is, is, you know, spend some time watching your sheep and learning their behavior. Uh, sheep will tell you a lot just on, on uh, changes in the way they act at feeding, the way they act when you walk in and out of the barns. Uh, you know, if, if, it, if there's a deviation in the way they act, you're, you're going to notice if you spend enough time during feeding and during uh, just normal hours, just watching and seeing what they do. Uh, you can see that that something's up if they if they change what their normal pattern is. So um, the next slide I believe shows a couple of ewes that are uh, from a physical standpoint, just looking at them and evaluating their udder. Um, you know their udders are full, their udders are tight. Uh, they, their udders can grow and develop and fill up like this everywhere from two to three weeks uh, from lambing. But if you if if I'd have gotten a good picture, both of these ewes have since lamb since I took these pictures. And if I'd gotten a good picture kind of in front of that udder, you can see the teats begin to swell up and start to get tight. 
um, and really pronounced and, and heavy with with uh, uh, with milk, and and that's usually a, a good sign that they're getting close to lambing. And then they will also, uh, as they get just within a few days of lambing, the the area right in front of their hips or between their rib and their hips that we call the loin, as those lambs drop down, as we as we call it, into the uterus, that area will sink in and it'll actually look hollow. And that's usually going to happen a couple of days before they uh, before they go into labor. And then, of course, you start looking for you know once they start pawing around, if you know they're gonna they're gonna start to, to strain, and and hopefully the water will eventually, or you will see the water break. Uh, I believe the next few slides are kind of showing this these stages: uh, the dilation of the cervix, the birth of the lamb, and the expulsion of the placenta are the the three main areas. But if you look at these three sides. So I took this pic, these, this series of pictures this weekend. I have to happen to catch the shoe. Um, and actually, I think she's the one you that's still left in the jugs in here. Uh, she was pawing around, digging a hole. I got this picture of her laying against the wall, her, her head starting to go back, her lip curling a little bit as she's straining. Then she got up and you could see that the water had broke. Um, you know, that's the first, the first placental sac is, that the lamb is, is surrounded in, has been expelled. And, and uh, usually there's a lot of times a bubble here uh, full, of, full of fluid. If it hasn't broke, I probably spooked her and broke the bubble and the water fell out. But, uh, uh, but that's, an, that's a sign that she's within probably 45 minutes to an hour um, of needing to have that lamb. So the picture on the left here is her standing up. If you look really closely, you can see the toes. Um, and I funny story about this is I think when my daughter was four or five years old, she was helping us check lambs and she came over to the barn and she said, Dad, you got one lambing, but everything's fine. I said, how do you know? She says, because the toes are pointed up. And my boss happened to be standing there at the time and he said, how did she know that? I said, that was the first thing I taught her was that if you, if you see feet starting to protrude, if you can see those toes and the points of the toes are, are aiming up towards the ceiling or towards the top of her tail, then the position is typically correct. So you're gonna count toes and you're gonna see if they're pointed up. Um, so if they're pointed up, that's typically front feet coming with the nose in between them, just like this lamb is. So that was the first thing we saw. I knew I didn't have to worry too much about her. I wasn't gonna have to assist, them, assist much. The next thing is in about 45 minutes or so, uh, I wouldn't say 45 minutes, about 10 minutes or so, we, we saw the head start to emerge on this lamb. Um, one thing you will find is with some of the heavier meat breeds like the hamps, um, <laughs> on some of the heavier meat breeds like the hamps, the heads are gonna be a little bit bigger. The shoulders are sometimes gonna be a little bit, bit bigger. This happened to be a first time lambing you, and this you, um, you know, did I did help her just a little bit. All I did is if you can, you can see the difference between the two pictures, the one in the middle and the one on the right, the right front leg or the top front leg is extended a little further. That's because I went ahead and grabbed a hold of it right there just at the, between the pastern and the knee and that little area um, right there about where its mouth is. I grabbed it right there where Carolyn is, is, is pointing with her, with her cursor. And I just easily pulled and put some pressure on that so I could extend it forward. So essentially what I did was I was straightening out, straightening out the elbow joint to make the elbows and the shoulder joints and, and that whole radius a little bit smaller. And then the lamb came, came a little bit easier that way. So a lot of times that's all they really need on these bigger meat breeds. Um, the smaller breeds like our polypase, I very seldom have to do this. Uh, their birth weights are much smaller. They're typically twins and triplets. So that makes the birth weights even smaller yet. And it's, it's usually very, very seldom do I have to assist any, any use in the poly breed, except for occasionally when one has three that are all trying to come at the exact same time. And we can talk a little bit about that later on. Next picture, I think this goes further. So showing more of the lamb, the rib cage coming through. Um, one thing I do tell people is, is if you are gonna assist use in lambing or you do have to take your time, don't get impatient. Uh, one of the real critical things for these lambs is, you know, those lungs have not inflated yet when they're before they're born. The reason, the way they inflate is as they come through the pelvis and through the pelvic cavity and, and through the, the vulva, that pressure is, is actually forcing the lungs to deflate, so to speak, or to tighten up. And then as soon as that rib cage, uh, where rib cage comes through the pelvis and through the opening, then it expands really quickly. And that's what actually gets that lamb to take that first breath. 
hopefully the the placental mm -hmm. sac is has opened up over the nose enough that they don't suck a lot of water in typically in a in a normal presentation that is not an issue but you know if you pull too quickly you don't allow those lungs that time to get that 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 response to happen that pressure on the lungs and then that quick reflex that allows those lungs to expand so uh so take your time don't get in a hurry um you know let the you have it on its own if things are going right don't necessarily have to pull it um you know sometimes you will have one that'll get to this point and in and, and hamps and some of the other meat breeds they will tend to hip lock once in a while so once you get to those hips you might have to a little bit put a little pressure on it to pull it pull it past the hips as well but let that rib cage come through on its own pace you know, if you're there and you want to assist and do anything, at least clear off the nasal cavity, make sure that the nose is opened up so that when it does, they take that first gas, it's getting clean air and not a lot of fluid. Next slide. So here she's gotten up. Um, she's kind of turned around and looking at the lamb and then very quickly, she'll turn around and start licking on him if, if everything goes well. Uh, this is a first time lammer, so I was extremely pleased that she was was nice enough to let me take these pictures and follow her through this transition and get close enough to her without running off and, and leaving me in the dust, but she did very good. And then, you know, she got right up and went around and started licking on the lamb. So uh, I'm going to mark her down in my records as a keeper just because she's she likes to, to perform like this. So uh, So everything went extremely well on this shoe. The far right, as you can see, there is another water sac protruding on this shoe, and that's very, very typical. Um, one way to be able to tell if she's going to have a second lamb or a third lamb is a lot of times that next water sac, if it's clear, um, odds are that's the surrounding sac that comes from a second lamb. If it's dark or red or, or bloody, kind of kind of the bloody color that this one is, that's usually the waste sac associated with the lamb that just came. Um, in a lot of our polypays, we can uh, we can tend to get uh, uh, you know two to three sacks hanging out on that second time. That means that she may have a set of triplets. So um, we must have somebody playing around with uh, drawing tools, and I'd appreciate it if they would stop. Thank you. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so yeah, you know this is very very typical. It might take her another. Oh, 45 minutes to an hour to expel the rest of that placenta. So here's a normal presentation. This is very, this is actually what you want to see. Um, you know, that's the, the nose headed up towards the, the tail head. The front legs are out straight in the Superman position, essentially. Uh, this one should not require much, much help at all. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, it shows you some issues that, that you may deal with in malpresentation in lambs. Um, uh, you know, like I said, this one, this one isn't going to require much, much assistance and, and she should have that lamb almost completely uh, without any assistance. So on this slide, the one in the middle is what I was talking about. That was a presentation of that lamb that we took pictures of. The only difference in the first one is it's not completely in the Superman position. The elbows, the elbows are back. So all I had to really do, and she'll have it, have it just fine that way. It just might take her a little bit longer to get things opened up enough that she can get those um, those elbows bows through. So all I did was straighten the elbows out. The one on the far left top row, uh, that's a lamb with a leg back. Uh, that's a pretty easy fix as well. Um, you know, just one leg back, uh, slip your left hand alongside the, the side of the head, um, maybe put a little pressure on the head to push it back with your fingertips. You just kind of catch the knee and, and very carefully and very, very uh, slowly kind of put some, some forward pressure on that until you can pop that front leg out and get both legs out headed the right direction. Uh, the one on the right, you know, is a little, even a little bit tougher. You're going to have to push that head back and try to find both legs. Um, and then if we go down to the bottom row, we get into some more challenges. Uh, the one on the, on the bottom left of the screen is the head back. Um, I don't often see that unless it's a lamb that's, that's going to be stillborn. Um, and, and a lot of times they get to be challenging. That's where a, a head snare like I've got here can sometimes come in handy. But typically, if you put some pressure back on those toes and push those toes back in just a little bit, slide your hand along the top of the head and just kind of easily cup the head and with your left hand or your, you know, I usually use my left hand in a situation like this um, and get my fingers under the jaw, cup the back of the head and just kind of easily uh, 
uh, slide that that up and around and, and into the birth canal. Um, backwards presentation is, you know, I typically just pull them this way. This is the only time that I say that you need to pull fast if they're born backwards. You do want to get that lamb out as quickly as possible because what did I say is that rib cage comes through, they gasp, and, and they also break the umbilical cord. Um, if these happen while the head is still in the birth canal, there's no air for them to breathe. They're going to they're gonna aspirate fluid. So uh, you do want to be a little bit more uh, 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 swift in pulling a lamb that's presented backwards. Um, this one is just backwards presentation, not a breech presentation. Uh, I don't see a picture of a breech one in here, but that's one where you reach in and you feel the hips and the tail, and you're going to have to somehow get those hind legs to straighten out so you can get that lamb delivered. Um, the next two slides are what we commonly see in our polyphase that have triplets a lot of times. The first two lambs will try to come at the exact same time, uh, and you may have to sort through legs and heads and try to figure out what you've got. And it just takes some patience and some experience and some practice to really be able to. It's hard for me to explain how to deal with these two situations without actually giving you some hands-on experience of how to do it. But uh, uh, it's just a matter of, of thinking about it critically you know, feeling around again, put a glove on, lots of lube, um, clean up the area as much as, as possible. Just be very slow and patient and careful. And eventually, you know, as, if you if you think about the anatomy and, and you know, pretend that, that, I mean, you literally can't see anything. So, um, so you know, you just want to take your time. So you care, you know, we probably maybe should have put this slide uh, uh, a little earlier because honestly, a lot of the you care is going to happen earlier. And, you know, we mentioned some things like shearing, like increasing the, the intake, the feed intake, the nutrient level of these ewes and making sure that they're on the right plane of nutrition, um, paying attention to body condition, make sure that they're not under underweight or, or extremely thin, or sometimes even more importantly, extremely fat. Um, ketosis is common in, in sheep, but pregnancy toxemia is, is fairly common in sheep, especially thin sheep that are not getting enough nutrition or extremely fat sheep. And what that essentially is, is the body, body reserves are starting to be used up in late gestation. Um, and that you can go down because she's putting more of her own stored energy into growing those fetuses in that third trimester than what she's taken in. And it'll happen in extremely thin use as well as over fat use both. So, uh, so having those ewes in the right body condition, we figure on a five point scale, you know, if those ewes are at least a three or a three five and, and, you know, can probably handle a four, but you don't want them much over a four, you got them on the, on the fat side. So, um, you know, those ewes are, are pretty comfortable going through lambing and we, we don't very often see ketosis and ewes that are in those body conditions, but those extremely thin emaciated ewes uh, that are carrying twins and triplets, they're, they're a prime candidate to have pregnancy toxemia issues, and uh, uh, ewes that are all extremely fat as well can, can be good candidates for that. So you care, um, just monitoring, um, you know, some, some things that, you know, I don't want to scare, scare people too much, but uh, vaginal prolapses can be an issue. Usually when people call me and have got issues with vaginal prolapse, the biggest thing I tell them to do is, or ask them is how much hay are they feeding, how much bulk are those ewes getting, and how prevalent are triplets and twins and quads in your flock. If you've got a lot of fetal development and you're feeding an awful lot of hay, you're putting a lot of pressure on the uterus in that room and filling up with, with, with forages, with bulky feeds. The easiest way to sometimes fend that off is to switch and offer more concentrated nutrients in grain and grain supplements and less forages. So start limit feeding your forages and increase your grain. But of course you wanna do that slowly so you don't wanna run into acidosis issues. Um, but again, those are some ways to fend off prolapse. Um, as far as you care at parturition, you know, like I said, um, you know, try to let her have them on her own. If she does need assistance, again, be, use care and caution and, and go slow and be, be careful with it. Um, you know, um, and, and usually she won't have too many issues. The biggest thing you want to check is you, as after she lambs is check that udder and make sure that both teats are functioning well, both are expelling colostrum. Um, you, you know, if you've got a ewe that uh, is not giving much colostrum and is very sensitive when you check her udder for, for milk, milk uh, care, she may have some early signs of mastitis starting to develop. 
So you want to think about that um, and watch her for that. But other than that, you know, the U doesn't need a whole lot. Uh, if you are in an area or if you have had issues with internal parasites through the summer and into the fall, at lambing is an excellent time to deworm your ewes to offer some wormer. Um, you know, right up after they lamb is a good time to, to knock out that, um, that uh, uh, parturitional rise in, in parasite load. And, and, you know, sometimes that gets things going. So, um, so you know, it, it's maybe a good time to, to offer a little bit of, of dewormer as they go through the jug. Um, you know, once they lamb, we bring the ewe and her lambs into the lambing room. <clears throat> we, uh, you know, we'll give them a few minutes to lick on the lambs outside. This is a ewe that I left out after she lambed for probably 30 to 45 minutes. I actually let the lambs get up and, and, and wiggle and stretch a little bit because the weather was nice and there wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, so then we, then we go ahead and bring them in. And when we bring them in, we put them in a fresh, clean, uh, well-bedded jug and offer fresh water to the ewe. Um, and, and we'll, we'll, uh, uh, care for the lamb's navel. Um, we'll, we'll clip that navel down to an inch within an inch of the body wall. I think that's what the next slides are going to show. Uh, here's the, the navel, hold that lamb up by the front legs, um, clip that navel with a pair of scissors within about an inch of the body wall, and then dip it in some 7% iodine or triodine, I think is what we're using now. Um, just to disinfect that navel and allow it to dry up and fall off. Then we put them together in the jug, give them a few more minutes, um, make sure those lambs are up and moving and the ewe is licking on them good. Um, like I said, we do not offer anything to the ewe, but a, but a little bit of fresh water. Um, you can see in the top left picture there, I'm stripping those teats out to make sure that her udder is flowing with milk extremely well. Um, make sure both sides are, are good and open and, and then you know, typically I just kind of walk off and give it 30 minutes and let the lamb try to find it on its own. And most of our lambs are strong enough and good enough to get that done. Um, but I do want to make sure that it gets up and gets its belly full of colostrum. I know some people that go to the extent of stripping the colostrum out and either tubing the lamb or bottle feeding it. Uh, we used to do that. Um, but I'm to the point now, or maybe it's just my, my age that, you know, I, or my philosophy and my attitude is, is these lambs need to be strong and able to do it on their own. So we try to try to, you know, let them do it on their own. And we've gotten to the point where most of our ewes and lambs do it uh, uh, very readily. The only, um, the only thing that I will say about this is the only change to that situation is in multiple births. When we have a set of triplets or quads, of course the ewe has only got enough uh, utter capacity or enough room on her utter, shouldn't say utter capacity, but she only has two teeth at a time. Um, what oftentimes happens in a set of triplets is you'll have the first one gets, is born and strong and healthy and gets up and will a lot of times strip every ounce of colostrum he can out of that udder before the other two get up and going. So a lot of times we will try to try to keep that from happening. We'll get that you brought in, get all three of them dried off and cleaned up. And then I will strip the udder, uh, strip the colostrum out of that udder and try to at least get a third of whatever I get out into each lamb or a fourth if it's a set of quads. If I feel like that's still not enough, I'll go to my colostrum reserves that are uh, frozen and offer some extra supplemental colostrum to those lambs just to make sure all three of them get a equal and, and uh, uh, opportunity to get up and get going. So, um, so we try to try to make sure they all get full. Occasionally, we'll have a weak lamb that'll lay around and not get going. So then I'll strip colostrum out of that ewe and either offer it on a bottle or tube feed that lamb. But I, I honestly try not to tube feed any more than I absolutely have to. So I know other producers in, in the business that'll tube every lamb to make sure and I'm fine with that. Um, you know, if you're comfortable tubing lambs, there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that you uh, use your, your tubes carefully and, and uh, uh, you know, learn how to do it correctly. And, and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with tube feeding lambs. So Todd, we, a, we just, go ahead, a Gene. Question uh, about uh, pregnancy toxemia, if there's a way to early detect that in a U. Um, you know, the, the problem I found with sheep is, and I tell this to people all the time, is they're probably one of the toughest species I've seen out there. They are able to fend off a lot of disease, a lot of pain, and a lot of issues. Um, and a lot of times by the time you notice that there's something wrong with them, their symptoms have progressed to the point where um, you're gonna have to step in quickly. So, so fending it off early 
may be a little challenging. Now, pregnancy toxemia, the first thing you typically see is, is a ewe that's laid out flat, has no energy, extremely lethargic. Um, you know, if, if you get one that starts, you know, that you're typically seeing her get to the feed bunk very quickly, very easily, you know, she's, she's fighting, she's got a lot of energy. And then all of a sudden one day, you know, she's, she's off a of feed, she's holding back, she's laying back. And then ultimately she physically can't get up and get to feed and water. Um, that's usually when, when we see the, you know, that's the first signs that we see of it. And then of course you want to, you know, if you, if you're really wanting to find out for sure, if that's what her issue is. Um, try to get a hold of some ketone strips from a veterinarian and, and do a, a urine analysis and see what her ketone level is. And then you're going to want to start her, start her on some rich uh, supplemental energy source, uh, propylene glycol. Um, you know, we'll even go to the point of using dextrose injections. But I have a little different situation here where I have campus veterinarians that are around on a, on a routine basis and can help me with issues like this. Uh, uh, so, you know, that, that helps too. But you know, really, other than finding than finding ewes that are that are are weak, lethargic, um, and then ultimately go down and can't rise and and move. Um, you know, they just don't have any energy. Uh, you know, there's not really a. I wouldn't say there's there's one subtle thing that I can pinpoint that's going to tell you really early that you've got problems. So, um, you know, hopefully that answers that question. Anything you want to add to that, Gene? Uh, because you're going to be up and close and personal with the U. If you don't have the ketone strips for the urine, you can also smell it in their breath. That's true. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So, and I think somebody asked, toxemia is is usually yeah, toxemia and ketosis are usually the same, essentially the same thing. So, pregnancy toxemia ketosis. Um, essentially, it's just a U that's extremely weak because she's putting every bit of the energy she, that she's eaten and all of her energy reserves into those, those, that fetal, those fetuses, the last couple. And it usually happens, I would say most of the time, it doesn't happen until they're about two to three weeks, or two weeks to maybe even a week um, from actually reaching the end of their gestation and, and ultimately parturition. So, so again, we talk about the bonding and these are, this, this, set, this jug on the left is one of our personal jugs, our personal flock. You can see a little bit different design a little bit more uh, uh, sealed up to, to keep the, the airflow a little bit more to a minimum uh, because we, in a, we are in a colder, draftier barn and we wanna keep those drafts off the lamb. But again, the, the design of the jugs is to assist in that bonding process. Give the lambs a few hours to, to get up and get going. We offer a heat lamp in, in these jugs. I don't necessarily have lamps in my jugs here, but we have a climate control building that we can keep it warm in so we don't have to do it so next slide i think so lamb nutrition again this all starts from you know day one uh hour one getting that colostrum in them um and then just keeping an eye on lambs and making sure that they're getting enough uh milk intake for that for those first few days uh, you're going to see lambs fairly quickly that are not getting enough nutrients in terms of, of mother's milk. They'll typically be hollow bellied. They'll be, you know, sunk in between their, between their, in their loins. Um, they'll oftentimes be head down, droopy eared and, and humped up. You know, they'll stand with a humped posture instead of, uh, uh, you know, in, instead of uh, uh, normal uh, spry posture. My wife likes to go around and poke the lambs and get them up and, and see them stretch. And wiggle their tails if they stretch when they stand up and their tails wiggle that usually means they're happy healthy and full if they get up and the first thing they do is hump up their back they're probably hungry uh they're cold because they're not getting enough enough internal uh body consumption to help maintain uh their their uh, uh energy stores and they're utilizing that internal brown fat that they utilize for for energy early on so you know the biggest thing is is just make sure you make sure your user are milking well if they're not, you know, you need to need to step in fairly early and start offering some supplemental nutrition in, in, in milk replacer. Um, and, and if you do use milk replacer, make sure it's a sheep milk replacer. Um, you can use other milk replacers, but honestly, I'm, I'm pretty afraid of them most of the time. And they don't have the, the correct balance of, 
of milk fat and things like that, that that lambs need. So make sure it's a sheep milk replacer or lamb milk replacer. Um, or, you know, if you can, if you've got a, a, you know, I know people that do use dairy cow milk, if you, you know, you can, if you want to, but I don't think your lambs are going to grow and do quite as well as, as what they will on a, on a fortified sheep milk replacer. We start offering free feed as soon as we can. So by the time we move them to the South barn and they're in those, those grouping group mixing, mixing pens, we have creep feeders set up and we offer, uh, try to make sure that you get a palatable, um, creep feed that that is is attractive to the lambs and kind of entice them to go into those creep pens um you know if you want to know what a creep pen is google it sometime i don't think we have any pictures of creep gates or creep pens in the in this slide set and i apologize for that i just kind of thought about it and we left those out um, but you do want to design an area where those lambs can go in and, and get a, a higher protein creep supplement they'll usually start picking at feed with their moms you know ours Ours will eat the hay and haylage from about the second day. You know, we'll see them nibbling at the hay, alfalfa hay a little bit. Uh, they'll start eating the grain alongside their moms a lot of times in, in just a few days as well. And then they'll start getting curious and going into that creep area. And once they kind of see that feed, if it's a palatable, you know, highly palatable feed that they like, ours happens to be a 19% protein. I know a lot of people that go as high as 22, 23% protein. There's a lot of different commercial creep feeds out there. You just kind of got to have to find what's in, available in your area and you can mix your own as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's the way we manage here. And we do that so that we can wean optimum, optimally at a heavy birth or heavy weaning weight as close to 60 days as possible. So I know other places that do not necessarily creep feed, uh, they're lambing later in the spring and maybe growing lambs on grass. And that's fine too. As long as your milk, milk is, you know, your milking, capacity on those ewes is good and and the challenge with that situation is dealing with internal parasites later in the spring and and through the summer so um we shed lamb and we use mama's milk to raise them and creep feed to raise them as long as we can and then we use our ewes to go out and harvest our forages um when they're uh once they're done so next thing that's critical is is record keeping um in our situation where you know we performance where we we sell most of our our offspring is performance-based sheep, so we're we're keeping good records so that we've got good pedigrees, we've got weights, we've got birth weights, we've got weaning weights, uh, we've got all kinds of data along with. This is just an example of an Excel spreadsheet that I developed years ago for our barn sheep that we keep uh, uh, records on, um, you know, by hand, just filling in the blanks here, and I adapt it as a, we have a research project that needs something different. I can go in and modify it and print it out. Um, but this is just our standard record keeping system. You know, each each uh, each section there is for one U and up to three lambs. If she has quads, we have to <clears throat> cheat and go down into the next space to add that fourth lamb. Um, but uh, uh, but it it's it's pretty easy to to follow along on what's going on. So if you read those columns, the you know, the date and the jug number, that's just so if I've got a student that comes in and I need to tell them, what, you know, which jug to, to go to, they can go find a lamb that way. Of course, the breed and the dam ID D number, the, the, the dam of the lamb is in the next column, sire. And then the lamb ID, the sex of the lamb, the birth weight, uh, the gene type is when we, uh, we, we occasionally write in the, the code on 151 on, on, our code on 171, I'm sorry, the, the scrapie resistance code. If we know what the mom and the and the, the sire are, we can write that in. Reared by is if I graph the lamb to another U, um, I can write down the U, U number in that column so I can track that. Uh, dispo, that's a disposition. So if I have a lamb die, I can write that in there. Um, and and what, what the date was. And then in the comments column, I can write anything from, you know, the health of the lamb, the health of the udder, um things like that uh we'll i'll show you after after a while we've gone to a more automated system in the last few years we're using um, radio frequency id tags rfid tags now and a system that's a little bit more immediately developing the computer records i still double up and do the hard copy on by hand but i also use the the eid system and of course for our program the ear tagging is critical uh, we need to make sure that we get those tags put in and, and we actually double tag everything. We put an RFID tag in one ear and a management tag that has their their uh, uh, flock ID number in the other ear so that we can track them. And we also paint brand the lambs as well. So I know a lot of people that don't like to tag lambs. 
Um, you know, they, they may use a little heavier ear tag and they want those lambs to grow and develop a little bit longer before they put a heavy ear tag in their ears. So they will paint brand. Um, we actually do all three, two tags and a paint brand and the user paint branded and, you know, we can track things accordingly. So the nice thing about the paint brand is you can see from a distance, if you've got a ewe or a lamb that's sick, you can figure out who it is and who its dam is and maybe who its twin or triplet is and be able to try to kind of start tracking down and figuring out what the problem is. Or if you've got a ewe sick, you can match her up with her lambs quickly and get them sorted off and put somewhere where you can deal with it a little bit better. So, but that's in a flock like ours where we're dealing with, you know, 200 ewes that we're lambing and we've got pins of 25. So um, some of those kind of issues. Oh, I see a comment there that, yeah, I did. And I'll talk about that. We do use a NutriDrench prod product and we also use a product called Spectinomycin or Spectaguard. Um, and we'll talk about that as we, as we tour a little bit. Um, we've had problems with E. coli scours through this lamin room in past years, years ago. And I talked to the, the Pipestone program veterinarians at that time, Dr. Kennedy and some of those guys out there uh, recommended that I just go to use Inspectagard along with the colostrum. So we give a CC a Spectagard or a, or a pump. It, it comes in a pump bottle. We give a pump of that. And along with it, you know, right before they're right with their colostrum intake, and then we give them another pump just for, for security purposes. Um, when we dock their tails at about 24 hours, we give them another pump. And we haven't had much E. coli scours in probably 18 years now uh, since we started doing that. Um, we, do, we don't use NutriDrench. We, we use the, the um, I think it's maybe lamb strength. Um, it's essentially the same thing, especially in those triplets, those, those multiple bursts. A squirt of that goes a long way in helping with their energy and getting them going. Uh, it's a good, it's a good, good product. Um, and then we also do use Bose. We did have some problems years ago with white muscle disease. Um, so we give a half a CC of Bose to the lambs um, at the, when we process them as well. So uh, that's just to fend off white muscle disease. So uh, we used to give a full CC. I, I decided to cut back on it to a half a CC because we have so many students and things like that, 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 uh, uh, help me get it and and I just want to make sure that we don't overdose anything since we switched to a half a cc we haven't seen have not seen any negative effects to doing that um, so half a cc has been fine for us I will I will show you some of those project products as we walk around on the on the tour what it's 8 30 already okay so we better probably wrap this up and start on the tour, Carolyn. I didn't realize how close we were getting. To... So, so docking, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, docking and wool breed lambs is extremely critical to prevent fly strike. Um, you know, where you dock is depending on, depending on your situation. Um, we will dock most of our lambs at the, at the last coddle fold right there. Um, the, the more of, of what uh, uh, the, the sheep industry would call the commercial dock. Um, you know, and of course, if you're into the business of showing show lambs or, or some of those kind of things, it, it's still common practice to dock shorter. Uh, we've gone away from the extreme docking. We don't do any of that. Um, mid coddle to full coddle is about as short as most of our tails are now. So uh, we'll, we'll show that here in a minute. We can, we can visit videos about that a little bit. Um, castration is another common practice in the sheep business, something that we don't do a lot of. Um, uh, the thing about castration is if you're going to grow these lambs out to slaughter weight, you do want to probably castrate because as they start to get to be rams, they get to be aggressive and start chasing ewes around. Um, you know, so you don't want, want uh, ram lambs chasing ewes. And, and in some areas, they do dock you if you try to sell lambs that are intact. But at the same time, in some areas, they give you a premium for uncastrated and undocked lambs. So, so again, it depends on your market and what you're, what you're selling for. If you're selling lightweight lambs, uh, directly at weaning, um, you know, there's not a really a lot of advantage in castrating lambs, to be honest with you. But if you're growing them out and selling them to feed yards out in the western areas, that you know, then you're going to want to dock and castrate for sure. Um, so, uh, so again, we we do docking and castration as early as possible. Try to get it done at 12 to 24 hours if we can. Sometimes castration can be a little challenging at that time because the testes haven't dropped down very well. Um, but but uh, 
but again, it's something that I like to do as early as possible while the, while the lambs are still on the ewe, it seems to minimize the stress just a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to turn my phone on now and see if we can get my video. And my wife is going to. Okay. And my wife is going to hold the phone and do the videotaping for me. And we're just going to talk a little bit about our situation. And, and now you, you're going to for sure have to throw me questions, guys, because I no longer can see the computer screen and know what's going on. So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> as I was saying, this is our drop pin. This is our lambing barn. This is our facility here. Um, uh, you know, this barn is, is split into three pins and at, at our peak can have as many as 180 to 200 U's in it. Each pin will hold uh, 60 to 70 U's at a time very comfortably. Uh, this is our January lambing group. We won't start again until about the 15th of February, and those ewes are still across the road in the general housing barn and won't come over here until about the 10th of February, I would say. Um, but these ewes are the tail end of my Januaries. Um, as I said, this barn has an earthen floor. Uh, we just continually bed over the top of it with straw. We actually put a couple of round bales of corn stalks down underneath to start with and then come over the top with straw. Uh, we let the ewes lamb out here. You can see the doors are shut currently. We do let the ewes out in the daytime and we feed big bales of, of hay, haylage outside, wrapped hay outside. Um, and so about six o'clock in the morning, I'll turn them out and let them out on the hay bales and bring them back in at usually five or six o'clock at night with just a little bit of, of corn to entice them to come in. Um, like I said, when we get 200 ewes in here, this is a pretty nice drop facility, um, you know, a pretty nice place to uh to, to house use and, and it gets fairly warm in here and poor old you walking over to the water tank is looking a little sore footed but i think uh, she's probably got triplets in her i would say so so this is our drop in like i said we let everything lamb out here um you know we that you that i took pictures of and hopefully the cat doesn't photo bomb us um uh, <laughs> So, so typically the ewes will isolate themselves normally in those back corners as far away from this alleyway as possible. So that ewe that I pictured was in that, in that back corner, that's the southwest corner of this pen. Uh, that's probably the most predominant place that ewes lambs. So we uh, bed that pretty heavily with straw back there because it gets pretty moist back there in that corner. Um, but that seems to be a favorite location for them to, to have babies. So. So we let them lamb out there and then we bring them into this into this room down this alleyway that I'm walking walking through right now come into here um, as you can see I've, I've kind of modified this barn and set it up with plenty of gates and uh, you know controlling the you and getting them to go to the location that you want is usually pretty critical so we've got this set up where we can we can bring them straight in this alleyway straight past the uh, through the doors and, and into this area right here. Um, this area right here is where I've got things set up. And if you look on this table, this is where my initial items are at. So if I've got to assist the lamb, I've got gloves, I've got lube, I've got the big bottle, but I've also got this little small bottle here uh, that I can take. Here's my lamb puller. This is what I was talking about that works good. Um, so if you've got a, got a ewe that has a head that's not coming, it, you know, that you get the front legs, but you can't get that head, a lot of times you can take this in your hand, slip it in. This part right here goes underneath the chin. This goes around and behind the ears, and you can kind of pull that head with this. Um, I have just used baler twine before or some rope, some cotton rope, um, if you need to help pull legs and put some pressure on that. Plenty of gloves, different sizes. Of course, these are sleeves. Um, here's our scrubs for disinfecting around the vulva and some gauze pads. Um, those things are always handy. Uh, I like to, when I'm pulling lambs, I like to put one of these in my back pocket when I put my gloves on and take this with me. Uh, this little apparatus is, uh, uh, you can buy this at most of the farm or the sheep supply companies now as an, I think they call it a nasal syringe or, an, or a bulb syringe. Um, my dad got them from when our, when we were born, mom always came home from the hospital with one of these. So dad took them to the barn and used them on baby lambs. It's really nice to open up uh, uh, nasal passages in the back of the mouth, get that mucus out. You can use this extremely well to, 
uh, to get some of those fluids out of there and help open up the, the airways on lambs. Um, other tricks that you can use if you have a lamb that's not breathing, tickle their nose with a piece of straw or drip just a little bit, a little drop of water actually in their ear. And that kind of gets that reflex or that, that gasping response as well. So that'll help. Um, other products that, like we said, we give the lambs, this is the baby lamb strength that we were talking about that we utilize. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be a, 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 a pusher of, of Premier products or Shepherd's Choice products, but I really like their products. There's a lot of different products out there. There's nothing wrong with Survive. There's nothing wrong with NutriDrench. They're all available as well. Uh, we've just gone to using this mostly because we, we buy a lot of our supplies from Premier One or, you know, or we've gotten some from Mid-States in the past as well. And uh, this is what one of the products that they carry. Spectaguard or Spectenomyosin is actually a product that's for pigs most of the time. But as I said, I've been using this for, you know, probably 20 and 25 years now because we used it when I was a kid in Wyoming too. So, but we've been using this to fend off E. coli scours. Works exceptionally well. So, so that's the product we have. Um, and then, of course, like I said, when we bring them in here and we, we want to make sure that that you, uh, uh, you know, we, we put them in one of these, these, these jugs. Um, I'm sorry, I did not. Here, let me grab a lamb quick. Come here, Junior. Where's my, give me a shepherd's crook. This one's seen its share of use here. So this is the lamb that was in the pictures. Come here, Junior. There we go. So this is the lamb that we were taking pictures of. So when we'd come in here, I've already, you can already see that it's dried up. But we, uh, uh, I put that table down to, a, to an inch, so it was about that long. And then I've got a, a tea cup. And this is something that I didn't learn even existed until I moved to Wisconsin in Wyoming. We didn't have anything like this. So we usually use baby food jars for the iodine. Um, you know, these teacups are nice because you can squirt a little bit of iodine up in the cup. Hold the lamb kind of with your knee under its hips and actually put that navel in the cup and dip it. I know a lot of people and, and I've had people tell me, well, why can't you just get a spray bottle? You can, and you can just spray them. Here's the problem. If you spray them and that, that navel is laying down like this, you're only getting the top side of the navel. So somehow you're going to want to flip that navel up. Either hold them like this and spray one side and then turn them over so you spray the other side. So that's why I recommend the tea cups and dipping them because then you get that whole navel and that whole area saturated. <laughs> right. Okay. So then we put them in the jugs. We make sure she's got plenty of milk. Make sure the lamb gets up and gets nursing. Um, that lamb is doing exceptionally well. Um, but if we don't, we do have one that doesn't get enough. I've got all of my, we walked right by the milk supplies. I've got all of my milk supplies over here. So this is probably the most critical one. You know, we invested in for a research project about five or six or seven years ago when Rusty Brzezette was here, we invested in a bunch of these utterly ease machines because he can milk samples at birth. And then they're really nice for, for pulling colostrum, work really good. And they're also good for storing. I bought a bunch of these small eight ounce bottles. So I'll strip colostrum out any of you that has, has a lot of colostrum and doesn't need all of it. And I put these in the freezer. So if I have one that needs a little supplemental, I can warm this up in hot water, put it in a bottle and feed the lamb. Um, if you don't have colostrum on hand, you know, keep some of these, these supplements on hand. This is a colostrum supplement from Shepherd's Choice. This is a first milk supplement from Shepherd's Choice. I'm not 100% certain what the, the difference is between the two, um, but I have both of them on hand. And then if you've got a lamb that's cold and an you know, older lamb that's cold and, and hard to get going, you get them warmed up, a little bit of this quick start mixed into some milk replacer works really well. Um, and then we have our milk replacer. I haven't got a lot of it on hand yet, um, but I've got some here. This is the Shepherd's Choice milk replacer, big gain here. Our first McNass here in Lodi carries it. So we've got that on hand. Um, here's the, the esophageal tube that we can use um, to, to stomach tube baby lambs if they need it. Uh, and then of course we have thermometers all over the place. These two boxes right here, if Lynette wants to walk around on the other side, if you have a hypothermic lamb, 
these are an event, event invention that we use to warm lambs. Um, open this one. So it's essentially a, a, an open box with a, a ventilated floor in it so that we can lay the lamb in there, use a hair dryer, a hot air or a, a hair dryer, inflate some air around the lamb. That'll help warm up the hypothermic. There's other, we have a lot of lambs that stay in our house. <laughs> so then we have an orphan pen here to the, the left with a heat lamp in it. A um, couple of orphan lambs that we're trying to get going, um, but we don't have too many of them. So, and then of course our, our creep feed, um, let's see, you know, this is our creep feed. We just brought a little, I just brought a little bit of it over today so that we can, it is a pelleted feed, runs about a 19% protein. Uh, seems to be working pretty good for us. So any questions so far, I'd ever Gene or Carolyn? Otherwise we'll keep, try to keep rolling real quick. I think, think we're uh, keeping up pretty well. There's a couple ones that we haven't answered that when we get to the end, uh, I'll see if we can't fit them in. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about our processing situation, what we do to process lambs. Um, and like I said, these lambs are a little bit older. I would have typically done this at about 24 hours of age. Uh, we've only got three ewes left in the jugs right now that haven't been processed to this point, but uh, uh, we'll go ahead and demonstrate our processing uh, to get them ready to go out of the jug. So this is a first time lammer. This ewe right here was the ewe that was born in the fall of 2019. I actually exposed her to lamb in the fall of 2020 and she didn't settle, um, but I did get, get her settled last August to lamb and she's got a set, really nice set of twin buck lambs right here. Uh, if any of you are on the National Sheep Improvement Program, uh, this ewe right here is gonna be one of the higher indexing maternal ewes in the breed right now. She's going to be in about 120, 124 range for maternal index. Her twin brother is actually one that um, I used and is um, also one of the higher ending rims in the breed. So uh, her full brothers, actually, she's got leading the leading NSIP for maternal index right now. So this is a ram lamb. So we will weigh him. I'm going to stick him here. So like I said, we've got a platform scale. You can use a hanging scale. You can use a bathroom scale if you wanna hold the lamb and zero yourself out. Um, but we like to take a birth weight and I'm gonna have to adjust this because this lamb is actually a little older than 12 hours old. So we've got a 14 and a half pound lamb. <coughs> I didn't have this set up. So as I was saying, we do utilize a, uh, let's see. We do utilize an electronic um, system here for tracking records. This is a, a Shearwell system with a FarmWorks database on it. And I'm going to skip it, I guess, and just go ahead and tag the lamb. But uh, what did he weigh? 14 and a half, just for sake of time, because I didn't have it up. So this is the electronic ear tag that is trackable with this device. It's actually our scrapey tag, so it is registered with the USDA APHIS as our scrapey premise ID tag. So we've replaced our big scrapey tags with these lightweight EID tags. And then this is the management tag that we put in all of the polypay lambs. So this is essentially their management number that will go into the computer system. Uh, this is the, the 12th polypay lamb born in 2021. So we will put those tags in their ears. So I've got taggers here, the lambs in the bucket. I've got a little Nova stand in warm water that I can utilize to dip these things in to both disinfect them, plus also make them a little bit more, uh, give them a little lube. Well, these tags are, uh, we put them in the front of the ear instead of the back. Um, that just protects them from catching on things. And then again, you can see what I did was I hit Right in between, here's that, here's that top vein and, and the middle vein. I went in between those two ridges, those two uh, uh, cartilage ridges on that, on that ear and put that right through. We'll do the same thing on the other ear. So if you look, if Lynette can show you, here's that top ridge right here. Here's the middle ridge. We wanna put the, the male stud of that tag right through there. So I've got my thumb right there right now. I'm gonna replace my thumb with the peg and flip it on through him, okay? The, we'll give a little squirt of the Nutri-Drench and another squirt of the Spectinomycin. 
and then the half a dose, half, half a cc of both C. That's in her body. So we'll give a half a dose of that. Pull the lamb up, give it some cue in the back of the neck. We change needles between every, um, usually between every litter. Um, you probably should change needles between every lamb, but uh, uh, you know, we do. So if we have a set of triplets, I'll, I'll pull up a half a cc, but typically every shot we give nowadays, we change needles between every animal, just for biosecurity and, and disease transfer to minimize disease transfer. So we go through lots of needles. <clears throat> then the last thing we're gonna do is go ahead and band the tail on this lamb. I'm not gonna, not gonna castrate this one because as I said, his mother's a, a pretty uh, good you in terms of NSIP and performance data. So there's a chance that he might actually be a um, stud buck prospect. So we, we use rubber bands, elastrator rings. You can use other tools. In our situation, this is the best because we're cutting off, or we're making a, essentially a, a wound and putting them back out into a dirty environment. And uh, uh, the tail seems to uh, heal up faster and, and cleaner with the rubber bands in our environment than if we used an emasculator or something like that. So I put them between my legs. So if you look under the tail, and if you remember those pictures that we showed, here's your, your uh, caudal folds. And the, the distal end of the caudal fold is essentially right there. So that's where I want to put that, that rubber band. I know some people that will put the rubber band clear up here, but I put ours right at the end of the caudal fold. We have had issues with fly strike with longer tail, even dock lambs that are left a little bit too long. We've had issues with fly strike. So we, like I said, we, we dock all of our, all of our white faced lambs and even the majority of our hemp lambs get docked right at the distal end of the caudal fold. So we put it right there. And if you see it from the top side, you know, you can see where that, that rubber band is at. Okay. Slip it off. And if you noticed, you know, one thing that I will see novice people do is make sure that you have this tool held the proper direction. So you put your rubber band on here. Don't go like this because you're not gonna be able to get the rubber band off and, and pull the tool back off. So you always wanna make sure that the pegs go towards the body cavity, just like this. Okay. So that's the, essentially what we do. Um, we'll put a paint brand on the lamb that matches their ear tag number. Okay, and then we'll return it to mama. Using rubber bands, the one disadvantage, the one disadvantage to using rubber bands is it does take a little bit longer for that tail to go numb and for him to get over the stress of the pain or the, the, the discomfort. You know, it might take him a, a half an hour to, to 45 minutes to get over that, um, but, uh, uh, you know, and that's why we do it as young as possible. We try to do it, you know, as close to 12 to 24 hours as possible because the, the nerve ends and the blood flow isn't quite as extreme and as heavily built in the extremities and in, in the tail at that point. Uh, so it, it tends to, to, to be a little bit easier on them if we do it a little bit younger. So, so then they'll stay in these jugs for usually another 12 to 24 hours after we dock their tails and get those things going. Once they get done with that, we move them across into these three pins on the on the outside wall here, uh, four to five U's at a time. Those are our smaller mixture pin mixing pins that are inside. I actually haven't used them much except for one U that had a lamb that was a little weaker. Uh, it's actually a triplet lamb that the other two were born dead and he was pretty weak. So I wanted to leave him in here so we didn't have to deal with the cold yet. He's about ready to move outside. Um, but these are our three inside mixing pins. Um, again, we offer plenty of fresh, clean water in those. We bed them and clean them after, you know, we might use them for, oh, two or three rotations of the jugs, but then we strip them out and let them dry as well. Um, that's the one labor intensive part of this room is cleaning. 
because it all has to be hand carried out this door to Lynette's right. So we don't have any way of getting a loader or anything in here. Um, even a wheelbarrow doesn't work in here very well. So it does take some time to clean it, but that's something that we just routinely do with chores every morning. Clean a few pins, clean a mixing pin or two. Um, you know, we can usually get a, quite a bit of cleaning done in here in about an hour's time. And then we have another set of four mixing pins out this door. Oh, we got an escapee. So these are older lambs. These Most of these lambs are probably four to five to, to week, week old. They're actually due to be moved across the road um, and put into our group housing area. Um, but this is, this is our January lammers for this year. So um, we are a little bit lower on numbers. What are you doing over here? You're supposed to be over here. Okay. So, so they'll stay in these pens and, and, you know, we'll increase the numbers of ewes and lambs in these pens um, up to about four or five in each pen before we move them to the south barn and put them in our grouping housing, group housing in groups of, of 20 to 25. So we usually do try to kind of group them by breed. Um, this year, I won't be able to keep them on the south side in, in breed variation as uh, uh, you know, we just don't have enough of any one breed lambing in January. So we're going to have all three breeds pretty well mixed together and we group house them across the road. So one thing I didn't mention is the three breeds that we have here at the station. Um, to my far right or over here in this back corner are all polypay ewes. We've got the four hamp ewes here in the middle. And then there's five of our seven winter lambing targies back there in the back corner. So it looks like two of them, two of the lambs crawled under the feeder and are in with the hamps. Yes, that black one is a targi. A question, Todd, about uh, how old do the lambs need to be before they can go outside? You know, it, it's not so much the age as it is just how much milk they're getting and their health. I mean, if they're good, healthy lambs, you know, you still want to offer a dry, um, you know, a dry place for them to get out of the snow and the and the wind, but. You know, on nice days, I mean, they could go out by the time they're 12 to 24 hours old, probably, but especially singles that are getting plenty of milk. Um, and I guess, you know, like I said, again, it just, it's more of a product of, of the milking ability of the ewe and the health of the lamb and how they're doing, um, so to speak, more so than it is the age. So uh, I, I really can't tell you what the best rule of thumb is, but, you know, it, it varies from operation to operation and, and production scheme. You know, ours could potentially go out, like I said, as early as go outside. But of course, we don't have it to where they're completely, you know, I don't I don't ever put them to where they're completely outside in the wintertime. They always have have some sort of shelter. In fact, our three sided lean to barn on the on the south side, you know, we actually make a fourth wall. We put up a windbreak on the south side and we actually have a curtain that drops down on the south side uh, just to offer a little bit more protection in the winter when we're lambing in January and February. And our, our personal buildings, we've done the same thing on. We've actually closed in that fourth side where they can still go outside and enjoy the weather, the sun, um, but they can get completely in and, you know, on a cold snowy day when it's 40 below or 30 below and 40 mile an hour blowing winds, it keeps the snow from blowing in on them. So hopefully that answers that question in a roundabout way. Other questions? Anything else anybody wants to see? I can maybe oblige. There's a lamb that, that, so the oldest lamb in here has already lost his tail. Oh, here's our, our escapees. That's the one challenge we have with this building or this room is our feeders are up off the ground. There is a, an area underneath that the lambs can crawl in underneath and tend to wind up in the wrong pen or out in the alleyway when they want to play. So these two little critters, they, they're pretty adventurous. Come on, get back in with mama. Come on. Some of you are in the goat business. I know if you if you raise goats, you'll have even more escapees than this. We used to have boar goats when I was at Texas A&M, so I do have a little bit of goat experience. They're not a whole lot different than sheep other than they have a very different personality. Any more questions, Jean? I'm just gonna go ahead and launch the poll while we're looking at your sheep. If you wanna keep talking, we'll just get that in. Thank you. That's fine. Well, they so, want to, somebody wants a better look at the Targis. Uh. <laughs> better look at the Targis. I, 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 I'm supposing that's Lacey, right? Is that, is that Lacey that wants to see the Targis? Uh, Kaya. 
Yeah, Kaya. Okay. Well, that's our that's our 2020 starter flock winner. I knew they were going to be on tonight. So, the Targi Association does the starter flock every year, and and uh, uh, our our winner for 2020 was uh, was in uh, Wyoming, Wisconsin. So nice to have you guys on tonight. I know your ewes are getting close, but we need to come up and see and see how they're doing. So yes, here is the Targis. And yes, there is a black one in here. I'm what sorry, do you think, but... Todd? Any thoughts on heat lamps uh, in the lambing jugs? So they have a purpose. They have a place. Um, I don't mind people using them, but I have seen an awful lot of horror stories about barn fires the last couple of years. And, and typically they, they trace them back to the use of heat lamps. So if you're going to use them, you know, use them with extreme caution and care. Um, and make sure that they're in good shape, that there's they're, you know, that they, they function extremely well. As you can see, most of ours are the, the, uh, again, I, I, I hate to be an advertiser for Premier, but because there are others that are just as good, but we do use the Premier caged in plastic heat lamps that are very easily to, easy to secure. Um, if they're, if they're not in good working and functional shape, they will not work. Um, so, you know, they are a little bit safer. Um, other people use the South Dakota State, the Jeff Held invention of a small barrel with a heat lamp screwed into the top of it. And those work exceptionally well and, and are good for the lambs and the mothers can't knock those heat lamps down. Um, but again, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say you, you shouldn't use them because there are times that they are very handy and can help save a lot of lambs. But just, I just beg and plead you to please be careful and make sure that they're in good functioning shape, condition, work well, and you've got them secured. Because uh, if they fall down and, you know, they're going to start a fire pretty quickly in all this straw. So we don't use them, but we don't have, I mean, we do in our personal flock pretty regularly. Every jug that we have over there has a heat lamp in it. Um, but again, I remind my boys all the time to make sure that they're secure and make sure that there is no shorts in the cord or anything like that before we put them up. So here we don't use them except on a, you know, like in the bum pen, I've got one hung up. Um, occasionally, we'll put one in a jug if we've got a lamb that just is really having a tough time um, maintaining his body temperature. Hey, Todd, can you go through the protocol of the, the stuff that you give the lambs when you're processing? I'm going to write it down and try to get it into the chat box. We have a lot of questions okay. for that. Okay, so when, when we process or when we cut, well, well, okay, so when we bring them in, when they're just, just minutes old, we give them a squirt. One, one pump of that spectamycin, that spectinomycin, the scour halt. And again, that's to prevent E. coli scours in the jugs. And then we give them a, a squirt of the baby lamb strength or Survive or Nutri-Drench or any of those products. Um, you know, usually a big single lamb probably doesn't need that. But if, if you're out in the cold and you don't have supplemental heat, sometimes that will uh, increase the time that that brown fat sticks around by giving them that energy source. And then, and then the third thing, and the most important thing is to make sure they get plenty of colostrum one way or another, either get up and get nursing or you supplement it or you, you know, strip it out. So those are the three important things as well as iodining the navel. Um, and then at 12 to 24 hours of age, we take a birth weight. We give them another, another squirt or a second squirt of the two products, the, the uh, Nutri-Drench or the, uh, baby lamb strength, and then another squirt of the spectinomycin, and a half a cc of, of Bo-C. Dock their tails, put ear tags in their ears, castrate them if we know they're going to be a weather, and put them back with mama. Did you get all of that, Carolyn? I sure did. Okay. Anything else? I'll go back over to my computer where I can kind of monitor the chat. I think I can be about half of the barn links away from my phone. So when that can keep one around. Any other questions? I think we've gotten most of them. Uh, Sarah asked about the milker. That is an utterly ease. You can buy it from Premier or Mid-State. 
they're not cheap. I will warn you up front. Um, okay, somebody four in the in the warming boxes. Lynette, let's go back over to those real quick. Um, there's actually two different ones and they're different designs. One of them has got kind of a mesh in it. Um, it's got a, essentially a plywood frame underneath with a kind of a mesh screen over the top. Um, and you could actually put a towel down over the screen if you're worried about that. But again, the whole principle is to circulate the air. This one here, the second one is actually a little different design. It just has plywood with holes drilled in it. So it's actually pretty nice as well. Size, I don't know how big they need to be. Um, you know, these are just two that I think Randy Godfordson built these when he was here, when I first got here back in the uh, late 90s or early 2000s is where these, these two have been around for quite a while. Um, they've saved an awful lot of lambs. It's helping warm up lambs. So. What? Yeah, the hole here in the front of the, the door is to let, you know, the that let fresh air come in or, or, you know, the, a lot of times we'll lay the lambs in there. Uh, most of the time when we put them in there, they're pretty, pretty comatose for the most part. So we'll lay their head right here. So they're actually breathing fresh air, not the air that's blowing up underneath them. So that's the idea of the, the holes in the front is to allow fresh air in and not necessarily just the, the warm air. Did I do a good job of going way over time again? <laughs> That's all right. There's a, one question about uh, temperature in the barn. And we were talking earlier about drafts, moisture, and pneumonia. Um, I haven't had a chance to reply to it, but my, my preference is to keep it as cool as possible. Yeah, you know, you know and, and I, I, the older I get, probably the more lax I am on this room, and I probably keep it warmer than I should. Um, you know, we've got a thermostat in this overhead uh, Resner heater uh, that, that keeps this room about 50 to 55, 60 degrees, something like that. Um, you know, we, we talked about we've got a project going on in the livestock lab on campus and the user going to go into a climate controlled room and she asked what temperature she needs to keep it at. And, you know, I told her, I said, well, where can you keep it? She said probably between 50 and 60. I said, that's probably a good rule of thumb there. Um, you know, the thing you got to think about is how cold is it outside that these lambs are going to have to go back out into and, you know, try not to make it too awful drastic from there. Um, you know, we don't have supplemental heat in the barn that we, we lamb in. You know, you saw that one lambing jug go from the mixing pen out of the, out of the mixing pen directly into those lambing jugs and then directly back into the other side of the mixing pen. It's all in the same room. Um, so we don't have any way of offering any supplemental heat in that room. So uh, so it's a little different situation. Um, and, you know, like I said, in here, I try to keep it, you know, where I'm comfortable, but I don't want to make it too comfortable in here to where the lambs, you know, get stressed when they go back out. So, um, you know, the, the, the critical part is, is to keep that draft and that moisture off of them, keep them dry. And, you know, in concrete, you have to think about ammonia development. If you, if you keep bedding over the top of wet bedding, um, you know, get, what I tell people do is to, to, to kneel down or get down at the lambs level and see what it smells like. Because if, you know, if you're not smelling it, they, you know, it may be a little bit more intense down at the level that that lamb is. And I think a lot of our lung issues and our summer pneumonia issues stem from too much exposure to, to pneumonia in some of these lambing jug facilities early on to not pneumonia, but to ammonia build up in the, in the, the environment. And it's, it's actually burning or irritating the, the respiratory system from the, you know, from the trachea through the lungs and causing damage early on. And then it intensifies as those lambs get older and the, and the weather starts warming up. So, so be so real Todd, careful about, go ahead. Sorry, we have some questions about maybe weaning, weighing at weaning and yep. then age, 60 days versus 90 days. Um, I, I think okay. it's a personal preference. I go about yep. 10 weeks yep. on my use, but that's just what yep. fits into my production system so, when I'm selling, so. Right. So with SID and with our management program, you know, or, or with, with, you know, being part of that program, we wean the majority of our hamps and polyphase right at 60 days. A case of cargies that I can have a pen of their own, we wean them uh, closer to 90 days. And the biggest reason for that is, is it's just kind of, that's the, 
the protocol that the majority of us have developed across the, the cross breeders, you know, that's what's typical for the breeders. The one issue I will say about our polypase is we had even our targies, we have some that are milking heavy enough that we have to be real careful because, you know, they're still milking pretty heavy at 60 days and we run into some issues with ewes that don't dry up as well as they should. So, but we still wean at 60 days as, as much as we can. Um, the ewes are, you know, like I said, those lambs are hitting creep feed usually from 45 to 60 days, pretty good eating, eating with the ewes pretty well. So by about six weeks of age or six, six weeks post lambing, we will start to decrease or completely take away the supplemental energy in, 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 intake. So we'll, we'll cut the corn on them. And for that last, you know, 10 days to two weeks, we'll try to also find some sort of a lower quality forage that will offer those ewes as well to get them prepared for weaning. Um, you know, we talked about vaccination programs on lambs. Our ewes are all vaccinated prior to lambing, but we don't vaccinate our lambs through the jugs. We vaccinate the ewes. Uh, then we will go through and booster those lambs with a Barvac CD&T shot or some sort of a CD&T shot at about uh, four weeks of age and again at about six to seven weeks of age. Um, we try to get all of that done prior to weaning so that when we wean, all we do is peel the ewes out and take them to another pen and those lambs stay right there in that pen. We'll take their weaning weight, we'll open the gate and sort the ewes off and leave the lambs put right where they're at. The only stress that they the only stressor they receive at weaning is the ewes leaving the pen. Otherwise, you know, everything else that's been done to them is done before weaning. So again, like Carolyn said, when to do it, optimum time to do it, uh, personal preference, your management scheme. Um, you just gotta kind of have to be careful and, and make sure you prep those ewes for, for lamb removal and you don't want to run up with, run into issues with ewes not drying up like they should be. All right. I think we have gone over time. It was a great program tonight. Um, but do you have any last final words, Todd, before we shut her down tonight? I don't think so, other than, you know, I am here for research and reference. So I shared my email address in one of the slides or, or still can. Um, you know, I am here. I'm, an, I'm available and, and, uh, uh, you know, contact me through email first. And if I can help you, I, I certainly will. And then, or you can contact Jean or myself um, as well. So we're all here um, for you to, to use as references. So, sorry, just trying to get our um, information up there. So feel free to take our email addresses down and send us an email if you ever have questions or if you'd like to continue our conversation from tonight. Well, thank you everyone for um, joining us this evening and we hope to see you in February. Have a great night.